Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Hello and a very good morning to you. I hope you're keeping safe and well despite the, the damp weather conditions we're having at the moment across the country. And our, our hearts go out to all the farmers that are trying to cope with the uh, difficult weather conditions at the moment and hopefully things will turn over the next few weeks. Today we're going to be talking about carbon and uh, as we all know carbon is the backbone of life on earth. Uh, we're all made of carbon and the soil in uh, on our planet is the second largest active pool of carbon after the oceans. However, its ability to continue to retain the huge amounts of carbon it stores have been weakened uh, in recent years, uh, largely due to unsustainable land management practices and changes in land use. And in this context, uh, it's important that we understand how much carbon is in our soils. And we're, today we're going to hear about the pitfalls of measuring carbon stocks from grassland soils. And we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Owen Fenton, who is a soil hydrologist based in Johnstown Castle. And uh, we're also joined by Cahill Summers, who's going uh, an asset advisor in Waterford, who's going to help us uh, with your questions later on. Uh, Owen, uh, Owen, you're very welcome to today's uh, webinar. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everyone. And good morning, Cahill. I hope all is well down in Waterford today. All good. Thanks, Mark. Good morning. So, Owen, um, in my introduction there, I described you as a soil hydrologist. Could you tell us a little bit about more about the, the work that you're doing there in Johnstown Castle? Yeah, thanks, Mark. So I suppose my background really is a bit varied. Um, initially, I would have studied earth science, geology and hydrogeology. So any interaction with soil and water I'm involved with. Um, and over the years, I suppose, like most people in Chagas, we do many, many things. So soil science has become, you know, way more to the fore in recent years, soil health, soil carbon. Um, and also I've been working a lot um, with colleagues like Pat Tuhi on organic soils in recent past. Mm. And this is an important topic for uh, farming in Ireland, uh, we're a uh, uh, livestock uh, intense, well, I suppose, a dominated uh, agriculture here in Ireland that depend on grassland. Um, how important are grasslands in terms of sequestering uh, carbon? I suppose we have a, a huge competitive advantage here in Ireland with our grasslands, um, but it's important I suppose my area is really looking at soil or organic carbon stocks and how to measure them, you know, um, getting down to the nitty gritty. That's that's one of my jobs um, and really calculating the exact amount. So the important thing for me is that if we want to know the carbon under our feet, we better, you know, do it properly. Right. Do it to a very high standard. And then that will give us, you know, the information if we want to compare the stocks over time. So. What's the carbon stock today? What's it going to be in five years and 10 years? And then how is our management practices affecting that carbon increase if it stays the same or if it decreases? So I suppose there's a lot of people <clears throat> within Chagas looking at measuring, um, measuring carbon through emissions um, or implementing practices that promote carbon sequestration. I suppose where I come into the puzzle is uh, I won't call myself a geek, but I suppose, you know, at the end of the day, someone has to do the number crunching. And that's where I am uh, down at that that scale. Brilliant. And and just before we get into your presentation, remind us why why this isn't so why is this so important? Uh, you know, we have a lot of talk about carbon accounting and inventories and the future trading of carbon. How how does this fit into that that broader picture? Yeah, it's a good point, Mark. I suppose if we don't know the stocks that we're, we have under our feet, it's very difficult then to you know give credit to farming, to carbon farming that builds carbon or maintains carbon. OK, so in essence, it's an accountancy exercise, right? So in accountancy, you need to get those numbers correct. You need to balance the books, in other words. Um, and that's why this detail is so important. In Chagas, we strive always to support agriculture by doing, you know, the best possible job we can. And in this area, soil organic carbon accounting, um, I'm going to go through my talk. I will show you there are lots of pitfalls when it comes to soil organic carbon accounting. And therefore, we need uh, globally, we need to get those things correct. OK, uh, we 
you can make a lot of mistakes. And in, in essence, when you look at reports or literature, sometimes the methods used to actually obtain that soil organic carbon stock number aren't presented well enough. So uh, if Cahal or I or you go out and try to compare figures, sometimes that becomes difficult. Mm -hmm. So we need, I suppose, when we monitor, when we verify and validate our carbon stocks, we need to be very transparent in how we do that. And I suppose my talk will show you the steps that we really are doing in Chagas to ensure that we get it, you know, the gold standard. We we are using that gold standard to calculate soil organic carbon stocks. That's great. Look, that's a really useful context uh, to, to get our heads around the importance of this. Um, so, Owen, we'll hand over to you and we'll take questions afterwards. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, okay, so I've been introduced. My name is Owen Fenton. Um, I suppose I'm a researcher down in Johnstone Castle in Wexford. And the title of my talk is Pitfalls When Measuring Soil Organic Carbon Stocks in Grassland Soils. So here I am, I suppose, the shadow pondering grasslands over the last few years and really thinking about soil organic carbon stocks and how to measure them. Um, this talk really is a product of um, this talk really is a product of work from many, many authors. Uh, we recently published a paper on this, and I would like to acknowledge them uh, during the talk. That would be Julia Bondi, Connor Bracken, Lillian O'Sullivan, uh, Luis Lopez Sangil, Patrick Tuhi, and Karen Daly. So by way of introduction, globally, soils and forests store vast amounts of carbon with agricultural ecosystems such as grasslands, peatlands, and woodlands acting as important sinks. Globally, as soils contain three times the amount of carbon held in the atmosphere and four times more carbon than the above ground vegetation, they play an important role in global climate regulation. I'd urge you to go on to the FAO, FAO website where they have a really good uh, calculator where you can look at global soil organic carbon sequestration potential of different soils all around the world. So what about Ireland? Ireland has the largest proportion of land under grassland in Europe at 56.3%. This compares with an EU average grassland cover of 20.7%. Agricultural grasslands have significant potential to sequester carbon dioxide as part of root biomass and in the soil. Now, to calculate this carbon resource in the soil, we need to use best practice when measuring, reporting and validating soil organic carbon stocks in grassland soils over time. Now, as part of the talk, I'm going to use an abbreviation for soil organic carbon stocks in places, and that's SOC. Okay, now there's sometimes confusion between soil organic matter and soil organic carbon. So just as a starting template here, let's go through those two things. Soil organic matter and soil organic carbon are often confused and mistakenly used interchangeably. So soil organic matter is the fraction of the soil composed of anything that once lived. It includes plants and animals, remains and various states of decomposition, cells and tissues of soil organisms, and substances from plant roots and soil microbes. Now, as you can see by the figure there on the right, soil organic carbon is the fraction of soil organic matter that is carbon. It has a wide range of crucial roles in agriculture. It impacts crop productivity, soil health, the movement of water, which I do an awful lot of research within my kind of hydrology um, area, and removal of contaminants. The soil carbon pool is composed of an organic and an inorganic carbon fraction, and we are interested in carbon accounting in that organic fraction, okay? So the materials derived from the decomposition of plants and animals. And the inorganic carbon part, which is carbonates from geological or parent material sources are not included in that calculation. So what is the purpose of my talk? Purpose of my talk, I suppose, is to show how soil organic carbon stocks and grassland soils are accurately calculated and to highlight pitfalls in these calculations that can lead to over or indeed underestimations of stocks. And I want to propose a standardized method for grassland soils in Ireland. Now the talk is not a comment on soil organic carbon stocks of grassland soils, nor does it comment on the sequestration potential of these soils or indeed the management practices that change these stocks, okay? So in a way, this, this talk really is about the calculations uh, of that stock. Now, why is it important to get soil organic carbon stock calculations correct? It best reflects how much carbon it is in the soil. So if we want to know that, we need to you know, do the best possible way of calculating it. 
it enables us to compare stocks and space and time. So what's the stock today? What's it going to be in five years? And what's it going to be in 10 years? And I want to make sure the method I use today is going to be correct and the same in five years and in 10 years. So I can compare those stocks. It's also vital to establish baseline carbon stocks. And therefore, we can use this baseline to compare stocks over time. So a lot of text there in the last few slides, so let's have a few pictures, okay? We're all familiar with how the Irish landscape looks. And on the surface, here's a, here's a grassland landscape. And uh, you can see it, it's subdivided up by hedgerows um, and it's a beautiful green landscape. Now, underneath that can be different soils, different soil types, and indeed, it can get much more complicated. So in the foreground here, we have a mineral soil which is more standard. You can use standard um, techniques in terms of soil organic carbon. But see the way after that red line in the background of the photograph there, things become more complex. We're moving here from a mineral into an organo mineral into an organic soil. And things become a little bit more complicated in the soil organic carbon stock world. How do we investigate soil? Okay, so in Chagas, what we do in terms of soil mapping, which has gone on now for decades, we would go out to a farm a field and we dig what's called a soil profile pit. You can see it here. You get a digger, you dig down to about one meter. You excavate a step at the back there so you, the pedologist can walk into the soil test pit safely and look at the soil in front of them. Okay, and what happens is in soil mapping terms, is that the soil profile is described into what we call horizons, okay? So you go for the topsoil first, and then you go down further into the profile, into the subsoil. Now, outside of that, you can't go around digging holes like that all over the landscape. So what happens is you define a modal profile, which best represents a soil type. And how you do that is you first go out and you auger the landscape, these thin slices to define where one soil uh, type starts and ends, and where another begins and ends again. Okay, And then you do a soil profile pit in each of those soil types around your farm, and you can look at developing a soil map of that farm at very high resolution. But of course, soils are not all the same. Even though you're standing in a field and everything is green around you, underneath your feet, different things can be happening. And that has, of course, consequences for carbon stock. Three photos here. Soils actually are quite beautiful when you look at them in profile. You can see the first one is quite glade, very, very heavy soil. And as you move right, you start to see the emergence of different colors, different layers, different thicknesses. And you also start to notice stones. OK, stones are going to feature an awful lot in my talk. Uh, our soils tend to be quite stony. If I move on again, you can see three different types of soils and the lines that I've drawn there delineate horizons. It's another point I want to make. In soil mapping, we tend to think of horizons as horizons change, but in soil organic carbon accounting, we tend to think in layers, okay? Linear divisions um, in a soil profile, 10 centimeters, 20, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters. And around the world, 30 centimeters seems to be the depth that people want to uh, measure soil organic carbon to, okay? So, that's the introduction. Now let's get into the nitty gritty and the calculations. Okay, so there's three legs to the soil orga organic carbon stock calculation. So in essence, it's quite simple. Okay, you take the depth of a soil layer, like I just said, for example, 30 centimeters. You multiply it by the soil bulk density of that layer. Okay, bulk density is the mass uh, divided by the volume of the soil sample in a cylinder, for example. And then you multiply the whole thing by the soil organic carbon concentration of that layer, and you convert it up to an area, for example, per hectare. Now, it's pit, the pitfall, the first pitfall here, really, I want to say is that it's rare in the literature or even in reports to document the exact protocol used to ascertain soil organic carbon stocks. And therefore, it's very difficult to know if you can compare stocks. So you simply multiply one, two, and three against each other here, right? That should be very, very easy. But let's see um, how that changes. We'll take the first leg of soil organic carbon. In the soil profile here, you can see now we're not looking at horizons, we're looking at layers. 
And up to now in, in Ireland, all our databases are horizon led because we were soil mapping all around the country for decades. So therefore our data is in horizon and not layer specific depths, okay? At the moment, the signpost farms, everything is in layer depth and Julia Bondi is leading that, that uh, program. So what I have used in the past and um, for this talk is horizon based and in the future, it'll all be layer based. That second leg of the, of the stock uh, calculation is bulk density. And here is really where things can go, you know, it can go wrong. There is a standard operating procedure for soil bulk density in the world. The FAO have very, very detailed information on how you take bulk density rings. And the most commonly used method is the cylinder method. So here is a picture of uh, Luis in the field. He's just extracted a soil uh, cylinder or core. And inside that is a particular mass. And because of the cylinder is a fixed steel cylinder, you already know the volume. You divide the mass uh, by the volume and you get your bulk density. Here's a schematic where there's a lot of steps involved. You have to put the ring into a guide, you hammer the guide into the soil layer, you extract it, and then you take that sample to the laboratory. Seems very easy on paper, but in reality, it's quite difficult um, procedure. Pitfalls here are, you need representative samples, which is not always possible. For example, if five people go into the soil uh, profile pit, I take the left, some people take the middle of that layer, and some people take the right side of the layer. Depending on the stone content, we might get different, um, different measurements of bulk density. Also, human nature comes in to play when you're in the field and you want to uh, avoid stones. People bias, user bias will go to areas of the, of the layer with less stones to take an easier bulk density sample. So there's a lot of operator bias here at play in the field. Now, when you take your sample from the laboratory, you bring it back, you bring it back. There's a temptation now to avoid the next steps to save money and time. And I'm going to go into that now in a little bit more detail. So how stony is our soil? If you look at the volumetric stone content of, sto of soils, there's a, a lovely schematic here from the FAO where you can visually assess a layer immediately in terms of stone content. It can go anywhere from 1% to over 90%. So if you look at the soil profiles that I showed you earlier on, the first one on the left is less than 5% stone content, and you start to increase across the greater than 30% over on the right side, okay? So grassland soils are vastly different in terms of how much stones are in them. And this is very, very important when you're going to look at bulk density. Um, and I'll show you now why. So on the left of the screen, method A here is the easy option, I suppose. Okay, you take your core in the field, you bring it back, you see the core there in the, in the silver tray, you put it in the oven, you get the weight of it, and you just uh, basically proceed um, further on that, getting the volume based on the cylinder and the bulk density might have a value of 1.2. But you have completely ignored the stones, and the stones have no carbon in them, okay? So it's very, very important to go over and to do method B. Now, this takes a bit more time, okay? There's more time needed in the laboratory, and, of course, added costs um, associated with that time and work. So you again take your core in the field, you bring it, you oven dry it, but now you sieve it through a series of sieves and you have the fine material in the base plate, and you have all these stones here on top, which you now remove, okay? So these stones are now not going to be in our calculation because there's no carbon in them. I hate showing equations in presentations because everyone goes to sleep, but in essence, the first method is very, very simple, and the second method there it shows that there's a correction made based on the stone content inside in the cylinder. And I'll show you why that's very important when it comes to the overall soil organic carbon stock calculation. It's also important to say that soil bulk density varies with time and with reflecting the impacts of weather and land management. So it's not good practice to just take the bulk density from one year and apply it to the second sampling, third sampling. 
you need a representative bulk density value each time you go out um, uh, and want to calculate soil organic carbon stocks. How does it look in a database? Often in a database, I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's very difficult to know what type of bulk, bulk density measurement was taken. So here's an example of a database. It simply says bulk density, and there is no associated documentation to tell us if that bulk density is the fine part of the soil or the whole part of the soil. Okay, so you're in the dark here about the method that was used. Here's the second red circle there as well indicates that there was too many stones to take a bulk density ring, and therefore there's no bulk density for that horizon or layer in the database. Okay, so therefore, how do you now calculate the stock for that horizon? Okay, so pitfalls here again are are in some databases, they use other parameters in the database to predict the bulk density, and they call this pedo transfer functions. Okay, it's great in terms of other uses for bulk density, but in terms of soil organic carbon, it increases the variance and uncertainty of the stocks. Okay, and it leads to systematic bias of the calculated stock and very high uncertainty. So, in essence, Representative bulk density values for a location must be used. And I always say it, real data is king. Now let's go on to the third leg of that soil organic carbon stock still. This is the measurement of the carbon itself, the concentration of carbon in that layer. Okay. Now there's many different laboratory methods used, and they all use that fine fraction of the soil sample. Okay. So in essence, you have to sieve the soil anyway to get to the fine material to get the carbon content. There's indirect methods such as loss and ignition to term, that determines the organic matter and then converts it to soil organic carbon. And nowadays there's direct methods such as LECO spectroscopy, all of which are used in charts. Okay. So although estimates of soil carbon based on converted estimates of organic matter can be useful, it's better to use direct methods. Okay, so if everyone is still with me at this point, there are the three legs. Now we're going to have to multiply those three legs together in all of the different combinations possible. Okay, I call this the soil organic carbon stock roller coaster. So please bear with me while I go through the next slide. Okay, so in existence at the moment, there's five different ways of multiplying those three basic legs together. Okay, I call them M1 to M5, which is method one, two, three, four, and five. Important to say here is that method four and five are seen as equivalent in the literature. M5 is simply easier to do in the laboratory, okay? M5 is great because there's less error associated with it. Now, instead of going through the equations, let's take the easy route and let's see what you really do with the bulk density and that soil organic carbon part of the calculation. So on the first method, the blue dots there are the stones. They're left in the bulk density ring. They're not corrected. And there's no correction for stones then on the soil organic carbon part. So both, in essence, are overestimated in the calculation. In the second method, thankfully, they go to the trouble of taking the stones out of the bulk density measurement, but they never then follow it on and correct in the soil organic carbon part. Okay, so that's overestimated. In the third one, the stones stay in the bulk density, but although they have done the work, they don't correct, and they correct for the soil organic carbon. In the fourth one, everything is done perfectly. You now have the stones corrected and the soil organic carbon connect corrected as well. And in the fifth one, the stones are left in the bulk density part, but the fines are the coarse material is taken into account, and the whole collect. Uh, calculation is corrected in one fell swoop. So I suppose M5 is a more efficient way of doing the whole process and the most accurate. So with all of those pieces of information and the five equations, we needed data to look at grassland soils in Ireland. So we have three databases within Chagas, I suppose, that we can use, and they have all of the information and data parameters needed to calculate method one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so they are the Irish Soil Information System, which has 300 reference profiles. 
It's important to say here, I've only included profiles that have real bulk density. No pedotransfer functions have been included in this data set. The square data set brought 30 reference profiles and the really good heavy soils program database uh, brought in 18 reference profiles. Combined together, it gave us over 1,000 data points. When you put it all together and do the important number crunching associated with this, you get all of the data jumbled into one. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through this figure. On the right side there, it says soil horizon, starting at the shallow and working into, into deeper soil horizons in that profile. At the top, you have the volumetric stone content. Remember I said stones can be less than 5% and all the way up to over 30%. So immediately you can see that we have soil uh, horizons included with very low numbers of stones and very high percentage of stones. On the left side, you have method one, two, three, four, and five, as I went through. And below is the average soil organic carbon stock found by each one. Okay. In essence, all of this data can be summarized into the following. Methods for measuring bulk density that do not break field dried samples into fine and coarse material through arduous sieving overestimate soil organic carbon stocks. The volumetric stone content of grassland soils in Ireland is high. Volumetric stone contents range from 0%, so there was no stones in some horizons, to 36%. And this was consistent with depth. So shallow to deep, some horizons had stones in them. Overestimation of soil organic stocks can be large where stones are not considered properly. So how large? How large are the stocks overestimated? So when we look at M1 to M5, the average relative difference in soil organic stocks between that first method and the gold standard, the average was 18.9%. But look at the maximum. You could have overestimated the stock by 388%. Okay? M2 to M5, 7.7%, with a max of 60%. M3 to M5, 8.9%, but again, huge discrepancy here, 310%. And M4 and M5 are seen to be equivalent. Um, and M5, as I said previously, has less assumptions, associated error, and is easy to apply in the laboratory. So everyone needs to follow best practice and be transparent regards the methods they use. So if I use M1 in year one, I use M2 in five years later, M3 in 10 years later, M4 in 15 years later, we will all be comparing you know, different methods of how to get soil organic carbon. And therefore, we can't acknowledge any farming practice has been the result of that carbon maintenance or increase. Okay, we put all that together into one slide, really. We can look at best practice in stony soils in Ireland. I foresee going forward that we combine the soil profile and soil core approach. We use the fixed layer depth approach. We take the soil organic carbon sample from the fine soil in each of those layers. We must get a representative bulk density, and we must obtain that greater than two millimeter fraction by sieving. We use that um, fraction to isobose correct right across the M5 uh, equation. Okay, so we have an equation now that we should be using for depth-based soil organic carbon um, estimations in Ireland. And we are using this method now in Chavez. So in conclusion, this research underlines the importance of robust, reproducible and accurate methods to measure, report and verify stocks on Irish farms. These findings offer valuable insights for policymakers, agricultural practitioners and environmental scientists seeking to enhance the accuracy of carbon stock assessments in grassland soils. This work provides a protocol for implementing best practices and measuring bulk density for carbon stocks and will minimize uncertainty and give confidence to the soil organic carbon stock calculated for future carbon farming schemes. And just want to point you to a few useful resources that I've mentioned, the Iowa State University within Chagas FAO, and I would urge you to read the entire scientific paper it's freely available and open access on Science Direct. And with that, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Owen. Um, 
you 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 talked us through very nicely there uh, a lot of detail but uh i think for for the uh the non-experts it was still very very uh accessible so thanks for that um oh and if could i ask you just in relation to you know who sets the standards or who who actually is responsible for saying right this is the test or it, has that standard been agreed by anybody yeah it's a very good point mark so the standard is actually set out so the IPCC, the you know International Panel on Climate Change, sets out the protocol and how to um, assess soil organic carbon. Um, that's there in the detail. The problem is that um, there's different interpretations of it. Okay. Okay. Um, and in the past, you know, people are not using, you know, all of the techniques that I've outlined. Um, in particular, the sieving step. It may seem like a, a small step, but um, really, you need it for both the bulk density and the carbon part of the calculation to remove the non-carbon com- component um, in your calculation. So uh, it's important to know if people are doing that or not. And for grassland soils in Ireland, particularly because we have high stone content, you know, the, you, you hear of lots of stories, um, you know, of people picking stones out of fields, uh, the stony grey soil of Monaghan, you know, it's uh, in yes. poetry in our in our culture, um, our soils have stones in them. Uh, it's very variable uh, in fields, in space, and in depth. And I suppose if we if we know that, we really need to take care to you know take those out of the equation, basically. Mm. So it's really important that that protocol is, I suppose, uh, adhered to, and uh, that maybe there's clarity around that. You know where there is space for interpretation uh, to 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 try and remove that ambiguity, if you want. Absolutely, yeah, and I think it's very easy to document what you did. You know, um, I think in a study you're meant to document your materials and methods, and you're meant to, which means that someone else can come along and repeat what you did. You know, it's not always the case, and in databases also it, there needs to be a lot of flagging of what methods were used to obtain the data in those. Mm-hmm. Well, we have huge interest in your talk this morning, Owen. We have a lot, a lot of people on board and particularly uh, from our international community, lot, lot joining. So this is obviously important topic um, and, and will become more and more important over the coming years when it comes to the crunch in relation to those calculations and uh, sequestration uh, potential within countries. Cahal, I see a, a, a nice few questions coming through there. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Mark. Uh, Owen, I suppose the one big one that's jumping out for people straight away is, you know, uh, there's a nice comment here, dare I scratch the surface, but how how deep do you go when you're estimating, uh, when you're taking your samples? Like, you know, you looked at a 30 centimeter sample, but do you go one meter, two meter, three meter? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I suppose our databases go all the way to over one meter, you know, so the Irish Soil Information System goes to, in some cases, I think 1.2 meters. Uh, that heavy soils program one goes to 1.4 meters in some cases. Uh, so we have the ability to measure our stocks, not only in the topsoil, but in the subsoil as well. And, you know, there have been studies in Chagas that have looked at subsoil um, stocks. And, you know, I've shown there on my slides, you know, those blue bars, even without even knowing the, the, the values, but there, we found a lot of carbon right down through the profile, okay? Um, I suppose, again, going back to this IPCC and uh, they they state in their protocol that we need to at least, you know, um, account for stocks down to 30 centimetres. So that's where that 30 centimetres comes from. Um, but as, as standard, we will continue to go to uh, one metre uh, when we are accounting for stocks. And um, it's, someone's kind of asking a question about the pitfalls, um, the historical data that's been, I suppose, used in research, if using the wrong method. I know you're, you've said you're using the really the gold standard method yeah. now, but does that data have any value for current research? Yeah, it's a very good question. So I suppose the good, the good news is that the historic data had everything included. So that's why we were, we were able to use the historic data, I suppose, to see how the calculations would, you know, fall with and without that stone correction. Okay, so the 
The only limitation with the historic data is that it was based on soil mapping, right? So the horizons were were taken. So in in the spreadsheets, you see, you know, variable depths. It's not always just this beautiful line to zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30 centimeters. But there are ways, you know, to look at carbon stocks still in that data to 30 centimeters. So it would have been far worse, for example, if the bulk density or the stones weren't accounted for in that data. But absolutely brilliantly, um, in all of the three databases, the full protocol was followed, um, which is great news uh, to establish baseline uh, information for us going forward. And can I ask uh, um, Owen in relation to the let's say the standard soil sample that a farmer would take or an advisor, uh, which is I think approximately ten centimeters. How how useful is that to as an indicator um, for for soil? I know we we use it for soil organic organic carbon, but in terms of the the the, the broader picture of that soil, uh, is is it is it useful? Yeah, well, I suppose uh, it's it's always useful to have data like the, the first 10 centimetres will tell you an awful lot because the most amount of carbon is stored, you know, um, in the topsoil mark. So um, although that 10 centimetres wouldn't be couldn't be used for, you know, let's say IPCC accounting um, in that sense, it would tell you about the carbon stock in that 10 centimeters and it would infer you could infer from that you know the direction of travel in terms of stock now the other thing is um in terms of mineral versus organic soil the organic soil is defined based on a depth you know so of carbon and organic matter content so there's always ancillary information that would be needed to put that in the correct context in other words okay. i have two kind of questions here for you into one on but um so the Department of Agriculture ran a big soil sampling survey over the last couple of years. So that's one thing. Um, it's it's quite manual, the type of work that you're taking, a lot of work. Do, do Can you use those Department of Agriculture samples or do we need a national sampling program? Yeah, it's a very good question. So I suppose um, my colleague Julia Bondi in the signpost um, program they're doing an unbelievably high resolution coring um, at the moment across all of the farms, including all the major soil types. And they are using the protocol based on a, you know, fixed layers. So I suppose I'd refer revert to, to Julia there. Um, so, you know, this has been done at large scale. And the idea there is to repeat, I would imagine, that survey over time to look at carbon stocks over time. It's key to look at it over time, you know, and carbon doesn't change very quickly. So, you know, you're talking about five to 10 year periods where you will go back and redo this. I suppose the important thing is that when we're looking at, you know, baseline information that we we do it to this degree, you know, uh, for that purpose. Other, other data sets then can be used, you know, as an interim in between that at higher resolution. And I suppose they won't need to be um, at such, you know, going to such degree as I've gone to here today. The, um, the, the big fear that's coming up in the questions is because it's so manual, um, is there a potential for it to be used on a large scale using sensors or some other way to, 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 to measure it, I suppose? Yeah, look, brilliant questions. And th there's research. So I suppose like in any scientific uh, area, there's research going on all of the time. You know, there is um, faster ways of measuring carbon, direct methods coming through, you know, Karen Daly spectroscopy in Johnson Castle. There is robotic um, systems now being deployed all over the world to collect soil samples at a quicker rate. OK, Um of course, there's there's real advantages of using those uh, down to 30 centimetres. Those systems probably won't be able to go deeper than that. Um, in some cases, you know, there's there's different methods emerging. So instead of the depth based method, which is really revolves around bulk density, there's mass based approaches, um, which are very, very interesting. Um, and it, it really depends on how fast the technology is catching up, I think. I think the question, the person asking the question is completely correct, like that if we if we want to go to landscape and national scales, we are going to need a combination of methods. You know, we're going to need real data in the ground. We're going to need modeling. 
we're going to need, um, you know, uh, the NASCO network in Ireland measuring emissions. Um, we need a whole series of tools to capture um, carbon sequestration and carbon stocks at that, at those appropriate scales. We have a question. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, Carl. Just a question in relation to the, uh, the 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 rate of compaction of soils and how that affects the calculations. Um, I read out the question here. Um, yeah. Is this yeah? Uh, does excess soil compaction have an impact on soil bulk density and therefore an or the organic soil or soil organic carbon stock figure will uh, will that be? Uh, different as a result of that uh, level of compaction, or how, what what influence does that have on the, the, the that bulk density have on the the, the, the yeah, overall it's figure? A, it's, again, it's a really really good question. Um, so for example, like one of the measures to increase so, uh, carbon sequestration is to avoid soil compaction, right? So, uh, I'll give you an example. If you have uh, if you take one field and you divide it in two and you compact one side of the field and you leave the other side of the field um, as normal, the bulk density will be different at those two sides of the field, but the carbon underneath could be identical. Okay, You now do the calculation, like as if I've showed you, and the carbon stock will be different because of the bulk density difference. Okay, Like think about it. Um, so in that sense, there is bulk density affecting your soil organic carbon calculation. It's very, very technical, but the person asking the question is asking a very, very good question there. Yes, um, yes. Um, very... So in other words, the land management is affecting, you know, um, the, the the stock calculation. Came from and one of our just, very... That's uh, just one point to add there, yeah. Mark, I suppose. It's a really, really good question. The, I suppose that's why people are trying to move maybe to other methods where if we could take bulk density out of the equation and use mass-based approaches, we may be able to compare things easier um, in in soils that are very vulnerable to uh, compaction. Okay. I, um, that, yeah, that, that question was from one of our, our more learned uh, viewers uh, this morning so uh, thanks for that question and just while you mention it uh, there Cahill you talked about uh, what what we can do to improve the sequestration potential of uh, our our, uh, our grasslands uh, if we look at those for a moment and I know we can have a whole separate session on this but just very quickly are there are there a few pointers there that you can offer there for how, how we can actually improve that sequestration potential within our soils yeah, um, I suppose Chagas would have a, a list, you know, of of things. So if you think about my slide there on the organic carbon, so it's how do we how do we affect that organic component? You know, the first one I mentioned there is avoiding soil compaction, uh, the proportion of grazing to increase that, you know, allowing hedgerows to be taller and wider. You know, Lillian O'Sullivan has done great work on that, improving soil fertility. There's things like establishing clover, multi-species swards, um, planting extra hedgerows, planting additional woodlands or forests, and you know restoring things like a drained wetland. Um, there's lots of ways that you can you know influence sequestration potential, and um, uh, yeah. So I think there's there's lots of things and ways to consider um, how to improve improve yeah. things in grazing systems. Well, look, it's a, it's a follow on, I think, to today, certainly something we, we can look at. Um, Cahill, they're still coming in. Yeah, loads. Um, like, Owen, you're getting a lot of um, compliments here. A great presentation. But okay. um, yeah. uh, one, I suppose, coming up, and, and it's a tricky one, people are talking about carbon credits, and we're not going into that here. But um, if there's different processes being used in different countries, even within the EU ourselves with the Commission and beyond, um, and we're getting different uh, results, uh, how is that going to affect, I suppose, other countries that are act actively using carbon credits in exchange at the moment? Yeah, I think I think at that scale, we look, we don't have to worry about things at that scale. You know, there's lots of bells and whistles and checks on um, when you get to those get to those scales. I suppose what I'm what I'm really really adamant that we get right is that at so. It is complicated, you know, at different scales. So in the field, farm, 
landscape, national scales, different methods are used. At some point, you know, you have to you have to start going into modeling and using networks of towers like Chagas have around the country to to measure emissions. Okay. Whereas I'm really back at the baseline and where where I see all of these in-depth studies, you know, these in-depth studies would cost cost a lot of money to go to this detail, right? So we can use the the types of methods I'm talking about here to, I suppose, track the progress of particular management um, practices to see how much uh, they're affecting se- carbon sequestration, right? Um, I think in the past, I'm really scrutinizing things that have, have gone on in the past. Um, and I think now everything has to become more standardized when it comes to validation. Uh, you'll often hear about monitoring, validation, verification of stocks. So this is where this is where this detail is. You know, if you want to prove something, this is the level of detail you will have to go. And I think there will be a very high level of scrutiny around the world when stocks are being documented to, you know, you'll, you're going to have to um, prove that those things are real numbers by uh, presenting the data on using the methods that I've presented. And it's going to be very, very important to get it right um, because in the farm carbon space into the future, um, things are are based on maybe, a, you know, a stock today and what's going to be in 10 years. So we need to be getting those things correct. Um, and I know that in Chagas, we are getting everything correct. And um, I think it's it's our role to be leaders in this area. And I think, you know, using the gold standard will ensure, you know, ensure everyone else uses that gold standard. Another really technical question. Um you mentioned, I suppose, the difficulties in labs for like bulk densities and even the sampling. Um, would you see big errors between different labs? And, and if so, how, how are you going to address this? Yeah. And even in the sampling techniques. Yeah, really good, really good um, question. You know, what we're, what we're always trying to do is get as close we can um, to the actual soil organic carbon stock in the field. Okay, and I, I'll say that as a scientist, as close as we can, okay? So it's always, you know, there's always going to be some inaccuracy there. It's just uh, any field um, technique uh, is open to inaccuracies. You know, the more experienced the person is, the better sample will be taken appropriately using the correct equipment. It takes time, you know, Uh, same in the laboratory. So um, if an example I will give you, I spent years sieving, sieving soils myself, right? And what happens is you go in, you dry a sample, and then you generally wet sieve, wet sieve that sample through a, a collection of sieves, and you dry everything. What happens to you is when you leave that room, your goggles are full of dust, your hair is full of dust, your hands are full of dust. And what you're doing really is you're leaving that laboratory with error, right? The error is actually on you as a person, okay? Mm-hmm. And it's not been included in the calculation, okay? So it's these practical things that are very difficult to avoid in a laboratory or a field setting. Um, and I suppose what we're trying to do here is, you know, set out or stall to minimize uh, the errors involved. But in every single um, field and laboratory method, the accuracy is always documented. And, you know, it's, an, it's rarely 100%. Okay. Question here, uh, um, Owen, in relation to another project, uh, the Terrain AI program, which is being run from Maynooth. Are there any linkages there with that uh, that project? Are you aware of it? Yeah, so I suppose all of the projects, you know, in this space are linked somehow um, because we need to be conducting uniform protocols. So in other words, what we've done across the projects, be it the signpost, be it Terrain AI, et cetera, is that... You know, the way publications happen is they they come out about two years after the work or a year after the work. So we are using, you know, a consistent protocol when it comes to measuring solar carbon stocks wherever we're doing field work. Um, Owen, there's, I suppose, going a little bit back to the process and, yeah. and trying to have a uniform process. Now you've discussed this bit already, but there's a suggestion here or a question, I suppose, 
how early are you in the stages of you know that gold standard to roll it out within Europe even uh, is the EU commission aware of it and uh, is it their intention to have a kind of you know everybody is singing off the same hymn sheet yeah I suppose yeah it's it's a difficult one to answer like for me there is a standard gold protocol in place yeah it's um so the IPCC have very clear di- um guidelines but it's always unclear whether that's been followed to the letter of the law okay and my my point here is that i've shown the consequences of not following it to the letter of the law and in some cases by taking shortcuts you can overestimate um stocks okay and in particular in areas with grassland soils that are very stony we have very stony soils so we really have to you know do this uh, correctly which we are um like there have been studies in Germany looking at grassland soils and in Denmark, um, we've they they've all they've all come up with similar results to us, but um, we certainly have higher stoniness in our soils, which means we're more vulnerable to inaccuracies. Okay, so those laboratory steps are very very important uh, when we were considering the bulk density and soil organic carbon. Um, the, and I suppose, so what I can say is I'm not worried about the gold standard being in, in existence. I'm saying is that people aren't transparent enough when they're documenting what they've done. And then that, you know, that undermines, I suppose, then um, when you want to compare stocks from one study to the other, sometimes it's hard to know if, you know, was M1 used, M2, M3, M4, M5 in those two different studies. So we have to get better at documenting what was done, okay? Um, and that's at all levels. So I'm, you know, to repeat again, I'm not worried that the, st- the gold standard doesn't exist. It exists, but whether it's been used um, to that absolute end degree um, all the time is up is up um, for grabs, you know? Is there other countries doing similar or um, dare I say, you have very specific data is is it being put into models? Yeah, so this data wouldn't be put into models yet. I suppose they're the next steps that, that are going to be used. Um, like at the moment, I think with the signpost series and the, the national campaign, I think that's the, the data that's going to be used at, at larger scale for Ireland, you know. Uh, that follows all of the necessary protocols, uh, highest standards. And I think that covers, you know, much more I suppose, soil types and land management types, um, which is going to be really, really important uh, going forward. Um, What I've done, I suppose, Cahal, really, and Mark, is I've gone into existing data uh, just to highlight uh, the pitfalls, um, as I've talked about today. And I think um, knowing those pitfalls, we now can, you know, continue, continue to avoid those pitfalls. We have a question here, Owen, and I think it's a good, good opportunity just to clarify something. The question is, does our relative stoniness in Ireland overall imply that we sequester less soil yeah. organic carbon uh, per hectare than our European neighbours? And I think that's not what we're saying. Is that, is no, that a fair and, and I think that would be, uh, you know, it's not correct to say that. So in other words... Remember what I'm saying is that all our calculations here to four have removed the stoniness um, in in our calculations. So, you know, we have been using the gold standard um, and therefore the figures that are being presented in Ireland by Chagas are correct. OK, um, it's my worry really is in in studies that typically uh, do not use this this golden standard method for some reason, you know, you may, they may choose not to save the soil, to save time and save money. Therefore they're not correcting. And therefore the figures they're presenting could be misleading. And if soils are, would you say a soil that is more biologically active would tend to have a higher car, uh, soil carbon uh, stock within it um, for, you know, earthworms and, Flatworms and all sorts of things. There, there's a question here in relation to that. That's, yeah, I, I, I won't. Uh, God, you're straying beyond my expertise, yes. now, Mark. But 
Um, it makes sense, right, that a healthy soil has the best opportunity of having, you know, maintaining or indeed if the correct management is on top of building soil organic carbon. Um, so healthy soils are happy soils, you know. Yeah. Uh, Microbes have our carbon in them too. Um, yes, absolutely. Oh, I suppose uh, uh, an interesting one. So uh, imagine if you did do a national sampling program as a baseline, how how soon would you suggest going back in again? Yeah, so it's a good, very, very good question. Um, I think 10 years, there was a European study there um, done around 2015 where they looked at changes, you know, in national databases. And they were kind of really indicating a 10-year period. Um, it's a slow process, right? So... Um, that ten years seems to be um, a general, a general figure. Of course, depending on the soil type, that might change slightly. But I think an average of ten years could be a good, a good uh, number there, Carl. Another real technical question for you again. So, on the likes of sampling and in the labs, bulk densities in in the rings, uh, is is it accounted for air pockets and and things like roots and things like that when you're when you're doing your analysis? Yeah, really good question. Very technical question again from someone. Um, so in a, in essence, anything that is considered coarse material and not living should be extracted from your your calculation. So, for example, dead roots as well. For example, um, um, anything over that two mil fraction. It's just getting very technical for the talk, but the reason for that two millimeter is. Uh, to extract or take away from your calculation all of those coarse fragments, which in Ireland really means stones um, from the calculation. Really good question there. And any opportunity to get a water question, but I see it in your presentation. Um, yeah. how, how does soil organic carbon impact the movement of water? Yeah, it's a very good, very good question. So again, soil organic matter is like glue, right? So it glues the, the structure of the soil together. Um, you know, if you, uh, in essence, for a water transport, um, soil is built up of sand, silt, clay, organic matter, and the, the combination of that creates a structure. A soil with a, a very good structure allows water to travel, you know, nicely in free draining soils, for example. Uh, the higher clay or silt contents in that soil um, changes the structure, becomes more massive, and then you get poorly drained soils, and then that prevents, you know, or impedes water uh, transport freely in that soil. So, you know, think of it, think of it soil organic matter as glue. That's good advice. Um, we're just coming up on the end of our session now, Owen, and um, I think we've gotten through most of the questions as well. Um, thank you so much for, for taking us through that very, very, uh, uh, as I said, in an accessible way, uh, the presentation will be available afterwards for people who want to go through the f the figures and the finer finer details. Um, any any events coming up uh, in relation to this, Owen? Uh, I know there's sometimes conferences and walks or relating to these types of topics. Um, any? Do you have anything planned? Um, not not in particular in this one. I suppose I would urge people next week. Um, if I could flag my colleague, uh, Pat Tuhi is giving a talk on management of organic soils. And I think the the one of my slides there, I suppose, had, you know, the standard mineral area and then you get into the more complex um, organic area. We're doing a huge amount of work, um, again, with Pat, but with Julia Bondi, with Luis um, and colleagues on like when you go to take a bulk density sample in organic soil, things are a lot whiter, for example. So you might need to use a little bit of different techniques. I didn't really get into that today, but um, I'd say watch that space. Pat's talk next week will, I think, will be a good extension of my talk. And we will be having events and workshops in this space in the future, Mark. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Owen. Uh, Cahill, thanks so much for helping with the questions today. And uh, just to let you know also that we have a, a webinar, a separate webinar taking place on the 25th of April. And you're wondering what has this got to do with sustainable agriculture? Well, of course, it has everything to do with sustainable agriculture because we are, uh, farmers are looking to diversify and uh, 
look at ha- their operations over the next number of years. So on the 25th of April, I'll be joined by Barry Caslin, Teresa Roach, Nick Cotter and Noel Casey, um, who are uh, Bar- Barry, are uh, entrepreneurs and are going to share their stories of what uh, their journeys, I suppose, through to, to the stage they're at within their businesses. So we, we'd love if you could join us for that. Uh, you can just look at the Chagas website and that's available on, on uh, to, to register there on the 25th at 11 a.m. So thanks very much. You've uh, given a good flag for Pat Tuhi. Uh You're 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 almost like his warm up act for next week. So I'm sure Pat would love 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 to hear you be described like that. So Pat is going to be focusing on grassland. Uh, Pete managing grassland. Pete uh, Pete's grasslands and um, what what we can do to to improve the the uh, the sustainable uh, management of those. So until next Friday, thanks again for joining us and uh, we hope you enjoy the weekend. Um, And uh, Owen, thanks again. And Carl, uh, we look forward to hearing from you again on the Signpost webinar. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.